On the 21st of December, 1975, six militants stormed the OPEC conference room in Vienna, taking 11 ministers hostage, killing three people, hijacking a plane, and demanding revolution. This is how they got away with it. On Sunday morning, the notorious terrorist Illich Ramirez Sanchez, known by his alias Carlos the Jackal, led the attack, along with five other members of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. They entered the OPEC building unopposed, through the front doors, carrying machine guns, pistols, explosives, and grenades in sports bags. The plan was to kidnap the most important oil ministers in the world and eventually execute the powerful Saudi oil minister, Ahmed Zeki Yamani, and Iran's oil minister, Jamshid Amuziga. Carlos and his team kicked down the doors of the conference, firing shots into the ceiling as the terrified delegates ducked under the tables. The Venezuelan ringleader introduced himself to the room, while fellow militant strapped explosives to the table legs. The self-proclaimed revolutionary thanked the Venezuelan oil minister, Valentin Hernandez Acosta, for his country's pro-communist stance during the Cold War, and then divided the oil ministers. The neutrals, Gabon, Nigeria, Ecuador, Venezuela, and Indonesia, were placed on the left of the room. The friendly countries, Iraq, Libya, Kuwait, and Algeria, to the right, and the enemies, Saudi Arabia, Iran, UAE, and Qatar in the center. You were then asked to take a message out by the government. And before rounding the corner of the corridor, where one would then come into line of the police, I called out, uh, I'm coming out with something from the men. Please don't shoot. Carlos made a British secretary deliver a communique to the Austrian government, demanding for authorities to provide the group with a bus to the airport where a plane would await them. They also called for a statement on the Palestinian cause to be read on Austrian radio and television networks every two hours. If the demands were not met, a hostage would be killed every 15 minutes. At 9.15 a.m., the plane carrying 42 hostages and the militants took off with explosives under Yemeni's seat and stopped in Algiers, where Carlos met with then Foreign Minister Abdelaziz Bouteflika. Five oil ministers and 31 other hostages were released. The plan was to fly to Tripoli to board a larger plane that would take them to Baghdad. But some reports cite that the killing of a Libyan delegate by Carlos angered Muammar Gaddafi, and he refused to give the kidnappers another plane, leaving them stranded on the runway. Carlos was forced to turn back the plane to Algiers, but he still intended to kill Yemeni and Abu Ziga. But after Algerian President Houedi Boumediene threatened to attack the plane if the oil ministers were killed, Carlos allowed all the hostages to leave. The culprit walked away with tens of millions of dollars, reportedly paid to him by the Saudis. After two days of hijacks and hostage takings, all the assailants were free to go. Shortly after the failure of the siege, Carlos was kicked out of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. The speculation is that this was due to the failure of the mission and for embezzling some of the ransom money. Later, Carlos's accomplices revealed that the operation was commanded by the founder of the PFLP. Now, Carlos himself claimed that the siege was funded by Libya's Muammar al-Gaddafi. Good evening. French police tonight are holding the man whose name has come to symbolize international terrorism, Carlos the Jackal. In the age of modern terrorism, few names evoke as much fear and fascination as Carlos the Jackal. Over the years, the Venezuelan carried out a series of kidnappings, bombings and high-profile attacks which earned him a place among the most infamous terrorists of the 20th century. Carlos was finally captured by French agents in 1994 and has since received three life sentences. He's still in prison today. He's depicted in pop culture as the rock star of the international revolution, a Marxist guerrilla and a serial womanizer, an image he despises. 
but others have picked out the romanticised legends and myths, instead portraying him as a reckless, vain, professional mercenary who, towards the end of his career, seeked money and glory.